So I think we are live. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the EDI session at BQUIT 2020. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of uh, speakers here today and we are planning to talk about, about our current working conditions and their impact on mental health in academia. Um, my name is Sabine Wollmann. I'm a postdoc at CAT Labs and my colleague, um, who is going to chair the session today with me is Juani Bermejo Vega. Hi, Juani. <laughs> Hi, Sabine. My name is Juani Bermejo Vega. I'm a quantum computing researcher at University of Granada, and I'm chairing this session together with Sabine. And so, well, first of all, we would like to welcome all the attendees and our audience. Um, we're very glad you found the time to be here today. And we heavily encourage you to participate in this session. So we hope it will become very interactive between you and our panel members. Um, so feel free to keep on asking questions and upvoting them. But on the other hand, we also encourage our uh, panel speakers to post back questions to the audience in form of live polls. So stay, stay tuned on Slido and pay attention to what's going on there. So setting up something like that would not be possible without a great team in the background. And there's certainly an amazing tech team that helped us so, so far, but there are also other members on this organization. And we, in particular, we would like to say thank you to Naomi Salomon, Jake Biele and Chloe Clear, who are PhD students in CAT Labs and who contributed heavily to making this year a success. Juani, do you wanna do you wanna introduce some of our panel speakers? Yes. Today? Uh, okay. Well, um, should I remind people how to ask questions? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. feel free to use Slido. You can yeah. do it anonymously. Um, please keep the code of conduct in mind. But yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yes, so as Savina said, uh, you can submit questions anytime through this software called Slido. You can also vote your favorite questions and we will be reviewing them and selecting the best questions. It will help us a lot if you try to make your questions as constructive as possible and try to follow the discussion. And without further ado, then I would like to introduce, I'd like uh, start introducing uh, our, our speakers, uh, our panelists. Uh, the first panelist, our first panelist is Dr. Emma Chapman. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, Dr. Emma Chapman is a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow. And she currently works at Imperial College uh, in London. In her research theme is astrophysics. And she's also an activist. Uh, she has done activist work on bullying and harassment in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And she's also part of the 1752 group and it's an association that works on the issue of sexual misconduct in research and academia. Uh, Sabine, would you like to introduce the next speaker? Yes, yeah, so I would like to introduce Carla Figuera de Morrison Faria. Uh, she is a professor of physics at UCL in London, and she's one of the very few female professors of mixed black heritage in the UK. And I, if I believe right, there are only 20 to 25. Um, so she has a long list of achievements, and I would like to highlight a couple of them. So. For example, she chaired in 2018 the Power Hour at the Gordon Research Conference on multi-photon processes, which aims at improving the conditions for women in science involving researchers from across the globe. She is also a member of the Inclusion Group for Equity in Research, um, that is short for TIGERS in STEM. And some of her future projects involve um, the Rosalind Franklin Summer Science Camp that helps uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds, which is going to happen in 2021. Our next uh, panelist is Rachel Herbert from Elsevier. She's a senior research evaluation manager at Elsevier and she's also an associate at the International Center for the Study of Research. She works on science metrics and has specialized on the study of how science metrics uh, are used to understand research. She's an analyst and author of the Elsevier's 2017 report, Gender in the Global Research Landscape. And she's a member of the Elsevier's Gender Working Group. She's currently involved in initiatives focused on how insights and data metrics and analytics could be, can be applied 
to further our understanding of the role of gender in research and Sabina, I would like you to introduce our last speaker. Mm -hmm. Our final guest today is Sophia Crawford. She's an EPSRC Doctoral Prize Fellow at the Imperial College, and I think it's a joint fellowship between Imperial College and uh, UCL in London. She did her PhD at UCL in London in quantum metrology and nonlinear optomechanical systems. She's a scientist with visual impairment, and she's doing a lot of activism and uh, work to help people with visual impairment. She's also the creator of VIP at Uni website, which stands for Visual, uh, Visual Impaired People. And she's regularly interviewing scientists on her podcast, University Inside. She's one of the new members of Tigers and STEM and actively could, uh, contributing to this research group. Okay, so uh, that is the full introduction of our speakers. And now we would like to move to the main topic of the panel, which is the, the discussion. So we're gonna structure the next uh, part of the discussion by uh, asking questions to the speakers. And we have grouped the questions in themes. So we will first ask um, questions on the theme on uh, visibility of minorities and the represented groups in science. Uh, then we will move the discussion towards bibliometrics and then harassment in academia and research. And finally, we'll talk about uh, solutions to the issues discussed. And our first questions to the speakers is, um, what difficulties do you think uh, underrepresented groups in research and academia experience? And that could be women and minorities. So, and you could talk about uh, anything that comes to mind. Everyone's quiet. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I, I don't mind starting. Don't um, okay, so I guess um, for for me it would it would have to be um, the active dissuasion <laughs> methods that we come across in terms of like harassment and bullying, the obstacles which are purposefully put there by um, those in power, um, where they exploit the people that um, depend on them for their careers um, and I think that's something inherent into academia and you know this this really affects minorities more but it does affect all of academia as I'll probably get into a little bit later. Uh, thank you Emma. I, I would like to emphasize that later we'll have uh, questions only about this topic uh, harassment, abuse, bullying and, and microaggressions. Uh, I would like to pass the word to the other panelists. Would you want to say something about the question what do what difficulties do underrepresented groups in science experience? Uh, sure, I can continue with um, some uh, uh, points about uh, the visibility of disabled people in research. So uh, I think I think you have to divide that, that question into two stages. So one stage is getting there and the other one is remaining in research. Mm -hmm. So the first stage is would be about um, actually gaining a, a science degree or a, a the appropriate um, undergraduate or master's degree to then continue to do a PhD. And this is very challenging for disabled people for, for a number of reasons. Some of them are purely me mechanical, for, for example, um, as a visually impaired person, um, which is also, I should say, this is why I have a screen uh, close to my face, so differently, so I'm not looking directly to chat, so I apologize for that. Um, for example, doing physics labs. Um, which is an integral part of a physics education, is not really possible if you can't see uh, what you have in front of you. So for example, if you're completely blind, it doesn't work. And similarly, the greatest, so the greatest challenge overall in, in undergraduate um, degrees is making the course material accessible and um, to ensure that you can have full participation in the subject and understanding uh, for, for disabled people. And this uh, has a very broad spectrum because disabilities are extremely difficult, uh, different and also difficult. Um, and so, so that, that would be the first part and I can say a lot more about that, but just moving on, um, we then have staying in research. So once you've con come through university, which, which not many people um, do, so many people drop out because of insufficient support. But then once you're in research, um, then a number of aspects of uh, research and the way it's structured today make it very difficult for certain people um, with their conditions to, act to actively stay in research. So just to mention a very few things, so um, a very punishing environment of, of high publication output, 
means that if you're just a tiny bit slower than everyone else, you fall behind. And, and then you're, you're in the long run, you're, you're immediately punished for that. Um, similarly, very short response times in uh, grant proposals. So some of them have a turnaround of uh, a month uh, after being announced, or for example, um, you're, you're allowed to submit a, uh, say, a response to reviewers, and that has to happen within three days. So if you're slower at writing, so for example, if you're dyslexic or something like that, um, th this is extremely challenging. And similarly, uh, also going, for example, going to conferences. So, so ironically, the, the coronavirus crisis has actually made a lot of events more accessible to disabled um, people. So I hope that we can keep some of these elements afterwards. Um, and then also the, the short term contracts and the fact that we're encouraged to move countries and such is extremely challenging because you need to, um, so often being disabled comes with more costs in your daily environment. So if you have to afford a mobility scooter, for example, or um, for me, I have to buy very expensive glasses, um, which then the government usually helps you with. If you move countries, that means you have to learn an entirely new benefit st structure. And sadly, there's no, for example, pan-European structure for disabled people. Um, so those are just a few of the things, and I'm happy to discuss um, more later. That last, I'd like to pass it on now. On the uh, gender, just, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, please you continue. Thank you. From the gender perspective of the work that we've been doing in recent years at Elsevier, looking at our data, we've certainly found that there's a really complex system in place whereby a uh, lack of representation or underrepresentation of women among researchers leads to all sorts of different outcomes. Um, one, for example, simply is that women publish slightly less, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail later, but women publish slightly fewer uh, research papers than men do. Um, there are also issues around collaboration that works slightly different for men and for women. Uh, and these, these, what we find here really affects career decisions, uh, career progression and grant awards as well. So there's, the, there's this kind of snowball effect, if you like, whereby it's harder to perhaps get published in a high impact or very prestigious journal because of some of the systems and structures that have at least historically been in place in those cases. Uh, and some perhaps of the uh, unconscious biases in place as well in some areas of the, the scholarly communication world. So we see, as I say, the snowball effect where it becomes harder and harder for women in particular to career, uh, progress their career and move forward with, with, these, with these aspects. I would like to make a few points as well. Uh, in terms of representation of women and career progression, a key issue is that, unfortunately, the burden of care is still overwhelmingly placed upon women. For instance, uh, I'm organizing a conference and many female colleagues who are professors who are quite established, they cannot join because during the pandemic, they have to look after the families as well. And what you see very often is that they have to juggle family and career in a system which is set up uh, basically for men, in which uh, still there is sexism. And even if you have a male partner who wants to help, that person is still going to be discriminated because they are going to see that person as someone who doesn't take his career that seriously, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you still have sexism. If you are going through, for instance, um, grant application processes or peer review processes, uh, what you see is that you have to fight really hard. And many people, including me, if there were no appeal, probably they would publish much less because you get your paper rejected and then you go and you appeal and you keep on fighting. But obviously this takes time and effort. Whereas uh, for uh, many of your male counterparts, you don't have this kind of difficulty. You also have, because I don't think the system is fair as it is uh, set up. And one issue also that influences the progression of underrepresented minorities, et cetera, and women 
is cultural relaxation. Because at the, at the end of the day, everybody talks about diversity, everybody talks about, okay, let's make these fairer and more inclusive. But if you look at it, the burden falls on the minorities. And this takes also time from their own work in science, because uh, you have to spend time, this is emotionally challenging, you uh, will be doing a lot of things which should be the duty of everybody. And unfortunately, uh, that's not how the majority sees this. And on top of that, if you look outside Europe, it can be very difficult for people to come to conferences or meetings and therefore keep up to date because these are very expensive endeavors. Uh, they require a lot of traveling. So it remains a very exclusive uh, type of event. Now with COVID, uh, I mean, it's a horrible pandemic, but one thing that is being positive is that at least you can see you can organize conferences for much less money and is much more accessible uh, to many people if you join online. Obviously, you also have to consider other issues, but all this is going to have a cumulative effect and is going to influence uh, the progression of minorities, the progression of women, and many, many, many times it's not taken into consideration and the system is very unhealthy as well. Yeah, thanks, Carla. I think you touched on something very important there, like some invisible hurdles um, existing um, for minorities in research. And something you already touched on is like some extra work or extra teaching, um, extra community service, or just in general, um, extra hours. But there's also another important one, which is almost equally as important to publication. It's the networking part. Um, have you experienced any differences on this aspect? Me, myself, no, but I have left Brazil a long time ago because I'm originally Brazilian. So I left home when I was 19 and I left Brazil when I was 24, which was a while ago. So in terms of travel, traveling to conferences and things like that, I can say that I was lucky in the sense that I was in an European environment. But I can see that many people who are equally good and who would be up to date and have much more visibility don't have this access because they, they are outside Europe. So if you would like to develop a project, it can be much more difficult. On top of that, there are codes of behavior which you have to learn, unfortunately, because uh, the way everything is set up sometimes and in some occasions is a bit like an old boys club, if you know what I mean. So this can be difficult if you come from an underrepresented group and you would like to network. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, but you have to know how to navigate. Uh, these environments. Can I just add to that that there is some re there's been research done on this this kind of um, uh, uh, thing that might affect uh, minorities and and uh, in particular women. The studies have been on um, for a few years now, and I was just checking because I wanted to attribute this to the right authors. Um, the earliest that I could find of this uh, was discovered in 2015 where the idea of glass fences was put forward. So we're familiar, I think, all of us with a glass ceiling. There's the idea of a glass fence as well. And that's uh, evidenced by the fact that women in research tend to do slightly less international collaboration than men as a whole. They tend to benefit slightly less if they are in a researcher and researcher, as in both, part, uh, both sides of the couple are in research women slightly tend to benefit slightly less than men. And there are also conference aspects to this as well, attending and travel and so on and so forth, uh, and also moving countries, so research and mobility. All of this plays out in, in a gendered way. And so the authors of this paper that were put, as I said, was published in 2015, so K.M. Yuli and co-authors, 
put forward this idea of glass fences. Mm -hmm. So do you think most of these difficulties we just touched on, are there something very quantum physics or quantum technology specific or do you see, um, or how do you see the status basically of the of diver the status of diversity in this field? Are, they, are these hurdles all equally strong to people or do they affect different minorities to a different level? Um, I can talk a little bit about the issues of uh, harassment, certainly sexual harassment. Um, when, when we've looked at different fields, there hasn't been a full comparison, but anecdotally in the 1752 group, um, our members are, are part sociologists, part astrophysicists, um, and astrophysics is, is got quite, quite a good diversity in terms of gender for physics, actually. Um, and one of the worst problems of harassment that's open. Um, I'm, I've got a hunch that astronomy, just for some reason, I don't know why, but, but, uh, but we just unearthed it a little bit more. I, I don't think that it, we're worse than any other area. But we've all, we also find problems of sexual harassment um, and, and bullying in, in female-led fields. For example, we've had, um, I won't name them, but there's, there's been a, a case in the US of a, of a feminist, a, a writer, a, a lecturer on feminist theory um, being found, being sanctioned. For, for sexual misconduct. Um, so I always, I always consider sexual harassment, sexual misconduct within, within academia, not necessarily a gender issue, which sounds a bit strange, but more of a power issue. Mm. Um, and it's more that we have a power hierarchy within academia um, where you, um, your career depends very much on one or two people and you're in tiny little fields, tiny, tiny little fields. Um, and if you annoy the wrong person, um, then your, your career could be over very quickly. And that, that could be true for, for women or men. So I don't think, I don't think there's any evidence that different fields of physics or, or, or STEM or even humanities have differing levels of sexual misconduct within them that is in correlation with their different gender makeups at the minute. I would like to add something that we should also not think about only sexual misconduct, but bullying in general. And what happens is as you progress in your career, the way it's been set up, it helps those who have a competitive streak who are power hungry, who are uh, ruthless. And many women, they emulate this type of behavior uh, in order to progress in their careers. So I totally agree with you that this is not an issue only that men have. It is a cultural issue and is an issue of how our research culture and how academic culture is. For instance, if you go to leadership courses for women, they always try to convince the women to lean in. Why not convince the men to lean out? Why say, why do you tell people, okay, you apologize too much, why not go to some people and say maybe you apologize too little? So what you are doing as a culture is something that is very individualistic, that is very competitive, and that is very ruthless. And what happens is, is that people who don't have some of these tricks, you have to have some, even if it's only for emergencies, they end up being selected out. And you end up with cases of bullying and harassment also in female-led groups. I know some women who are horrible bullies and they sit in uh, equality and diversity panels and they're feminists and they don't realize that they are bullying like a lot of people. And this is unbelievably sad because these are behaviors that they have emulated uh, in the course of their careers because they saw this as the only path to success. 
in that case. And they'll yeah. keep on doing this, keep on doing this, although rationally, they are going to be politically engaged and feminist and this and that, but they have behaviors you wouldn't believe. They're absolutely unethical. Yeah, I, I found it really striking that um, the, the Welcome Research found, uh, Foundation, they, uh, they changed their policies two years ago now um to say that when you um if you hold one of their grants and you're you're found you're, you're sanctioned for some kind of uh, misconduct or bullying then people can complain and your grant could be taken away from you that's an incredibly progressive policy it's the only one i know of in the uk um and actually the, the first person to to be publicly uh, punished i guess by by that by that route was a woman uh you know who had their who had her 3.5 million pound grant taken away from her so I found I found it quite upsetting <laughs> that, that it was it was a woman <laughs> who was the first person to to um, experience that now we do we've done a small survey we took um, we worked with the National Union of Students the NUS and we canvassed I've forgotten how many a few thousand a few thousand students not under 10,000 um, across the UK and we asked them whether they'd experienced sexual misconduct and of those that did um, it was around 75% a male perpetrator around 17% female and then the rest were 1% uh, non-binary and then the rest of it was was prefer not to say so it was a significant proportion of, of women but but definitely overwhelmingly male yes can i just add um a, a really quick oh, sorry sorry they're overwhelming male because of a question of power as well absolutely there is a question of for me it's a question of power but we are in a patriarchy and the men hold the power so <laughs> yes. this is what happens um sophia sorry you wanted to say something no no worries i, th I think that was really good to 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 um, clarify that. Um, I, I just wanted to add a very, very quick thing um, uh, based on what Carla said, um, noting this, that as women we're often taught to lean in and such. It, it reminded me of a very good point made by someone who worked for a gender equity program in India who came to UCL at one point um, to speak, who said that any program that focuses on fixing the victims, as in fixing women in this sense, um, should be viewed with skepticism in the sense that if we are if the approach is, um, okay, so women are, uh, for example, gaining fewer fellowships, let's send them on a training course on how to apply for fellowships. Um, that is, is just treating the symptom and similarly telling women to, to lean in um, instead of looking at the fuller structure and asking how can we make this a more inclusive environment and how can we change the, the, all the individuals or, or ask all individuals to participate. Um, that, that should be the... The, the more general solution to, to go towards. So uh, something that we've seen said is that uh, harassment is fostered by hierarchies so about the power structure in science. And that this is much more general than sexual harassment, including bullying, psychological harassment and abuse. What would you say about the, would you say harassment in research is a very widespread issue? And what is the effect of having a culture that foments harassment in, in our community, the net effect. Um, I can maybe make a quick point from, from the disability point of view as well. Um, so I think because it's such a high octane environment, any bullying or harassment will also disproportionately affect people with pre-existing mental health conditions. And so in the sense that if you don't have a mental health conditions, maybe you have a certain level of resilience, um, but even so you, you shouldn't need it, right? Um, but if, in a very stressful and high pressure environment, any bullying will, will be amplified. And this leads to people with pre-existing conditions suffering even more. And I think that there are many studies that show that mental health conditions among PhD students, for example, is consistently higher um, so depression, levels of depressions, um, uh, suicide and such um, uh, are very prevalent among, among PhD students. And that I think is a, is a scandal. Um, this shows that the, the levels of support um, surrounding PhD students um, and also formal structures within universities, I think are not enough. 
and especially to pro provide additional support for people who need it, um, it's often quite, it can be quite difficult to access because you have such narrow pyramids. So often you have one PI who's not necessarily trained as a manager, um, who then heads a group of PhD students. And if you are, for example, the only PhD student in this group, it's very easy to feel isolated. Um, and then with, with mental health issues and such, that, that will just make it much worse. I would like to say something as well, is that I observed that many times they try to cure the symptom, but not the cause. So at university level, you see that there are a lot of programs and you can go, for instance, to counseling, you can go to this and you can go to that, but they don't really address the cause of why this person is undergoing uh, that particular mental health issue. It could be that that person is in an environment which is unhealthy per se, that that person is being bullied. It can be that the pressure is too much. I mean, and if you look at it, it's crazy because what is really happening is at all levels, you have pressure. So you are talking pretty much about the pressure that you have when you are a postdoc or PhD student, but PIs also, they get a lot of pressure. So it's unfortunate because this pressure is passed from above to below. And there were studies of uh, the UQ, commissioned by the UQ, which showed that we work on average 55 hours a week to 60. Hours. Yeah, I, I have the graph here if you want to see. Yeah, yeah. So because you think that you act, yeah. you know, yeah, sure. it it destroys everybody' mental health because we, you are already totally stressed, and then you have to supervise people, you have to do admin, you have to do this and this and that, and basically, yeah, this is. Hang on, I'm always struggle with this sharing. So basically, can you see it? Uh, it has started to change. Oh, yes, we can see it now. Yeah, so this is how much we work. So, this is the distribution of uh, working hours per staff, professor, etc. And especially, professor, you see that you have a huge peak here 56 to 60 hours, which is Absolutely insane, but if I look at it, that is pretty much what I also do, like 10 hours a day the whole week, and then Saturday you collapse, and Sunday you work half a day. So this is unhealthy, and what happens is that you pass this on to all uh, the people who are working in your group, and it's just a system that tries to extract the maximum profit with the minimum of resources. I, I it has think it's, in a way that everybody ends up being exploited and is horrible. Can I just add really quickly we, we, that yeah. this is, uh, yes, this, yes, I think, sorry, thank, thank you. Um, this is the main problem, I think, for, for disabled students, <coughs> is that when you start your undergraduate degree, you're extremely reliant on uh, academics goodwill. Um, so I've, I've spoken to lots of, for example, um, uh, mainly blind people, because that's my, uh, the people I come, come in touch with um, the often, uh, the most. Uh, who, who are saying that some of the lectures just didn't plea, would they, they couldn't get them to be accessible. And so they were replaced with one-on-one -on -one time with the academics. And this, this requires the academics to have this spare time, to have the commitment and the willingness to, because this is, you know, extra, um, you know, unpaid. Uh, it is the job uh, as lecturers, but it is additional work that's not often factored in. And as a, as a disabled student, you, you can push yourself, you can, you can use all the resources that the university um, makes available to you, you get some money for equipment and so on, but if you don't have this goodwill and the time by academics given to you, um, then it's, it might sometimes be really, really hard for you to finish your degree. And so I think without a happy workforce, any additional um, resources or help needed 
will, will simply not be available. So, so I think if you want disabled people to progress into science and academia, you need to make sure that the academic environment is happy and, and has the additional time and resources to help them. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. It, it, it would seem that having a happy working environment is a very reasonable request. But in research, we don't seem to yes. have it. <laughs> Uh, I make a... add something. Uh, yeah, uh, we also made studies uh, you know, like on working hours, like Carla's picture in the Max Planck Society, and we reported we got a very similar numbers. People are working extreme amounts of hours, like PhDs in the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Munich. Uh, when we did the study, we're working 55, 60, 65 hours average a week. So, yeah, please, uh, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah. Um, that's terrifying. <laughs> that data, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's really hilarious to me because um, I'm, I'm lucky if I get 30 hours a week done <laughs> um, with, with, with the kids at the minute. Um, and it's, it's funny how much, um, I guess, again, I depend on the, I'm so sorry, I've <laughs> Do you know what that was? That was my husband grabbing my um, my baby's blanket because she can't go to bed without it. <laughs> so we left it in the study. Apologies for that. Um, I didn't time that to no be problem. one of those internet memes. Uh, as I say, <laughs> yes, um, I have got away with working a lot less since I've had kids. But it, um, as Sophia said, it, it actually requires a happy workforce around me to uh, allow that to happen. So it, it requires um, my teaching load to be absorbed into the community, for example, um, and things like that. So yeah, I agree with that. But I just wanted to, if, if, if I may, just go back to Joanne's um, uh, question, which was about the prevalence of harassment. Um, so I think you were asking about how prevalent the, the problem of harassment and bullying was in academia. Um, yes. and whether, whether the wider cultural context impacts that at all. Um, yes. So again, the UK has not led the research here because um, it's incredibly difficult for us to procure funding in the UK. The government isn't that interested in this problem. If you compare that to America, um, America and Australia actually, they had, uh, in Australia, it's a human rights issue, actually. The Human Rights Council in Australia put a huge amount of money in to canvassing over 30,000 of their students across the universities to try and pin down the prevalence of it. Now, the 1752 group specialises, as it were, in um, power-based or softer student, specifically sometimes, softer student sexual misconduct. That's just how we, we grew. Um, and so the numbers for that are around one in 20 female undergraduates experience some form of um, sexual misconduct from a teacher or advisor. And then when, when you go to postgraduate level, um, it becomes a lot worse in both Australia and in, and in America, it becomes around one in six. Um, so it's significant numbers, but obviously we are talking about a niche form of harassment and bullying here. It's power-based sexual misconduct, but it's, it's, it's a lot. And, on the question of how the cultural side of things uh, impacts it hugely because i mean first of all when 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 this um this kind of thing happens um ideally you would report it and your institution would protect you um against retribution for example and they would they would do the right thing to get justice by you um but actually the policies that are in most universities for dealing with with um harassment and bullying have been written by biased people so it's one of my bugbears are that people refer to policies as if they are these godly pieces of paper <laughs> that have been written by you know people without bias uh, without discriminatory thoughts and that's complete rubbish like most of the most of the um policies detailing uh, the disciplinary processes were written you know 30 years ago in the 1990s when universities in in the, in the transition after thatcher's government that's when rape was still legal in marriage and so if you consider that you know what that person was with their biases writing that policy absolutely it's, it's in it's in every letter of it in the way that it doesn't protect um people that, that have mental health issues for example it doesn't accommodate for them um 
and you've got the actual people leading the investigations as well, they're, they're going to have their own biases. So you, you have to protect against this about how, uh, by having panels of investigators, for example, instead of a single one. Um, just little, little fixes like this, and I'll, I'll stop talking now. But, um, hopefully that's answered your question a little bit. So Emma, you already, you already touched a bit on, on these um, kind of um, harassment procedures. Um, so I think what, what's often standing in the room about like um, microaggressions or when people experiences it, there's a very sub, a subjective um, point of view. Um, maybe we could briefly talk about it. Um, what's the difference between um, maybe giving you um, your supervision and trying to push you to unlock your full potential in your PhD or in your postdoc. And um, what's the difference between this and the difference to microaggressions and harassment? Because often it's like if you have never experienced situations like that, it might be quite challenging for you to distinguish between the two. And when would you suggest? Um, potential victims to become active and trying to reach out to other people? Um, it's a really interesting question. So, hmm. <laughs> the, the problem of when something becomes bullying or becomes harassment is basically the subject of every defense panel for somebody that has been investigated for this because quite often people will say that was not their intention. It was not my intention to make them feel that way. Um, intention should not really have too much sway on a repeated action, which is what harassment is generally defined as. Um, I think one of the most important things we can do within academia with this incredible difficult question is to educate everybody about what is acceptable um, and that really came through in our survey actually we we canvassed the students for the kind of behaviors that they thought was were acceptable for example is it acceptable for your supervisor to invite you for dinner alone is it acceptable for them to I can't remember all the other ones now, but contact you by direct messages on social media. And we, we went through a whole load of these. Uh, is it acceptable for, for, for sexual relationships between PhD supervisors and students, this kind of thing. Um, and what we found is that the students tended to have quite a strong sense of what, what was acceptable or not. But at the same time in the data, what it showed was that the people actually experiencing sexual misconduct, 90% um, of them, didn't report it and um, of those about half of them didn't report it because they weren't sure if it was serious enough and actually we could see what it was that they had said was not serious enough and we're talking about um, uh, behaviors right up to rape um, and so it's incredible how we can convince ourselves in terms of, of self-victim blaming um, it's it's the problem with harassment and this is this is why within sexual misconduct we use the term sexual misconduct instead of sexual harassment because harassment um usually it's it's termed as an unwanted behavior when you experience an unwanted behavior and actually we argue that within sexual misconduct in academia what we often see is a is a grooming we often see like a, a very gradual grooming of victims where a serial harasser will canvass their students and see just see who 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 finds something who finds that sexual joke acceptable and then they might push the boundary a little bit further and see if they still find it acceptable and suddenly this person a year later finds themselves way over the mark that they originally said of what was acceptable um, but they feel like it's their fault because they allowed it at every little step. And so it's about educating everybody right at the beginning about what is acceptable, what is okay in a professional environment and, and keeping that professional environment so that I don't want to sound like everybody's <laughs> like we're in a, a you know, a, um, uh, a police state, but where behaviors are in the open in a professional way and that we can mediate it when things get pushed a little bit too far i guess i i hope that's was there anything else you wanted to comment on because i've yeah. forgotten 
I think this already sounds like a, a huge gray area, um, which is really, it, which can be really hard and challenging to deal with. Um, I think there's a question from our audience and I think they would like to know um, if there's a difference between their um, sexual misconduct um, you know, amongst postdocs and amongst PhD students. Is, can we observe there any difference or is research is a researcher? Um, I'm not quite sure of the question there. Do you, do you mean, sorry, do you mean um, as in you're experiencing it as, as a PhD student from a postdoc or do you mean within the... I... Hang on, I find... I mean, to be I honest... I think it's about num numbers. Yeah, I think... <laughs> N the numbers is more prevalent. yeah uh, it's more prevalent yeah. in no all we have data on is undergraduate versus postgraduate and so that postgraduate yes. encompasses um the phd students postdocs uh i don't believe there's any data on on postdocs okay, sorry i think i was thank talking you. over someone there. Mm. um you, you also Thank you. I think that was the question that there was a difference in uh, different stages of seniority in what, what it is more obvious. At some stage. I would like to add something uh, to this discussion about okay. bullying and harassment. One thing that you observe a lot with this gradual process is that it puts the victim in denial because the victim doesn't believe this is happening. And on top of that, can put the leadership in denial because uh, they don't want to admit that they hired a bully or that this thing is going on. So it is very painful for the victim because the victim is going to, once this uh, denial phase uh, is uh, gone, they're going to try to seek channels to solve the problem. And they will have to repeat the same story of bullying or harassment or whatever over and over and over and over again. And this is emotionally very painful because many times they are not believed. And sometimes people don't trust you immediately when you report it. I think I, 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 I agree. Uh, Oops, um, yeah, they don't sorry. trust you immediately they also don't know how to proceed there's huge lack of training there is unconscious bias that a behavior is open in their faces but they just realize when the whole thing has blown out of proportion and also the question of what are priorities there if one is trying to protect the institution or trying to protect the victim. So uh, these things, they do play a role. And often what you see uh, by bullies, uh, not only by harassers, but by bullies, is that uh, there is some kind of appeasement strategy, which definitely doesn't work. The bully is always going to try to pull things a bit further to see if they can get away with that. And then there's going to be some appeasement from the side of the leadership. And then the bully pushes it further and further and further. And this just doesn't work. But that is a very common scenario uh, in academia, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I'd agree. I, um, Sorry. Please continue. Yeah, um, I, was just say, yeah I, I agree. Um, this, this gradual grooming process uh, implicates all of the staff around as well who watched it happen um and who uh turned away from the evidence in front of their eyes that something wasn't quite right um and that really doesn't work in the favor of the victim when they come forward and report because actually all of the people around with power as well uh feel implicated and don't want to admit that, that they had a enabling role in it. And so, I mean, personally, in my case, when I, when I came forward, it, it, you know, it's, it's amazing how many people claim not to have seen things <laughs> um, because they, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't comment on them, on personal motivations, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you within the data and anecdotally that 
the whole structure stinks. <laughs> So we, we already spoke a fair bit about their structure. What is, what is a un, typical university response? Are there any typical responses to such situations? Do we have the right response mechanisms in place? Or do you think some of them are not appropriate? They're, they're coming from a very, they got developed years back when things were perceived in a very different way, as you already mentioned, Emma, or they didn't get updated? Yeah, they're complete. They're not fit for purpose um, across the board, across, across the UK, across the world in academia. The disciplinary processes and codes of conduct in place are absolutely not fit for purpose. They are discriminatory. Um, if you take one example, um, which is an early one we worked on with The Guardian, we, they, they uh, free FOI'd freedom of information every UK university about what their policy was between staff and student sexual relationships. Um, a third of UK universities had no policy at all <laughs> um, and of the rest of them uh, at the time this was five years ago ish now um, only one university in the UK actively banned um, relationships between staff and students uh, so now it's a contentious issue so whatever you believe whether you think there should be a ban or not um, the fact that so many UK universities had no policy at all <laughs> is, is really worrying because at the end of the day you need to protect the people that are in a power imbalance this is what it's all is all about a power imbalance and you have to protect the person on the lower end of that um, and you cannot do that if you do not have a policy Also, an issue and what? Would be if the Sorry. policies are implemented, because sometimes we have policies that are not uh, really up to date. But even when you try to implement them, they are not. Yeah, agreed. It has to come with training and it has to come with responsibility. So we believe in putting responsibility right at the top of the university hierarchy. For example, one of the mooted suggestions recently was that the, um, the vice chancellor of the university should uh, be on the board that receives all of the complaints within the university so that they, they have direct ownership of the issues coming on, going on within their university. And so they cannot say, oh, well, I didn't know it was going on, it was buried. It's their name that would appear in the Guardian <laughs> if, if something blows up, you know. So instead of the head of department or something, it's the vice chancellor that should have oversight of these kind of things right at the top of the university mm -hmm. so that it can't be buried. Can I ask you, when developing policies for, to, for, to, to make safe spaces for all employees, how do we work best work at the level of the institution or at the national level through associations? Sometimes institutions tend to make policies which are very non-transparent or protective. So what is your opinion? Um, so we work both on an institution and a sector level. Um, individual universities have come to us for consultations and we, we've given that for them to reform their policies. But we don't like reinventing the wheel every single time for every single university. And so ideally for us, we would work on a on a sector level and that's what we've done so I've, uh, in the slack i've put a link to our um, guidance for the uk sector on reforming disciplinary processes which came out about three weeks ago four weeks ago just before the lockdown um and <laughs> If we could have one wish, <laughs> it would be that a sector body, for example, UKRI or Office for Students, OFS, would um, engage with that policy and in some way make sure that all universities uh, in, within the UK followed the same policies. Um, I think homogeneity across the policies is, is, is really... Uh, I've forgotten the word, so it's, uh, it's the kind of thing we really want. Um, because perpetrators can move between universities so easily, you know, you can't have one university that, that kicks out perpetrators very, you know, nicely, and another university that looks the other way and doesn't ask the right questions when looking at the references, for example. It all has to work together. Um, Otherwise, you just you just do, you just play past the perp, 
is what we call it. Um, you just end up in a game of that. But yeah, ideally we would see sector-wide regulation. Bad word apparently, but regulation <laughs> is what we'd like. Can I ask whether you think the prevalence of temporary contracts for postdocs um, exacerbates this? Yep. <laughs> so I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking, so I'll make it very brief. But yes, um, what we have seen anecdotally in several cases is that universities wait it out. So sometimes if there's a big case, um, you bring something forward, the university knows that you've got six months left in your contract. It's very easy to make a process last the year and then you just walk away. So yes, precarity is, is very important. Um, I think there's a very similar related question by Anonymous on Slido. And this person asks, how can we help tackle the strong culture of overworking, PhD, overworking at PhD level? So for example, having these working on the weekends and late nights, no holidays, and pr still protect our mental health. Um, how do we do that? Um, or if it happens to us, how, how do we start protecting ourselves from this? Um, I personally think this is the responsibility of the PI to um, to set clear expectations and not to expect we can work. I, I think that's that should be very clear. Mm -hmm. I also think so, uh, throughout my PhD, no one ever talked to me about any how I access the holiday system. It apparently existed, um, does exist, but uh, I never used it. Um, and so I think with more well defined. Uh, holiday, you know, what, how much holiday you can take and when you've taken it and, and the conditions around that should, should send the clear message that you, you actually, you're entitled to this holiday and you should take it because overwork rarely uh, leads to more better research. Uh, you, you know, you can churn out more things, but with the, will they necessarily be more, you know, the, the high quality stuff you're looking for? Um, I, I don't think that's a strong correlation. Thank you. Uh, I have an, I have another question. So, um, when you undergo reporting a form of harassment and things do not work out or cannot be resolved positively, what does that usually mean? I, um, does it usually mean that automatically results in a backlash to the victim, or does it just? it just never gets resolved. And also what does it mean for, for the wider community if such a person, a harasser or a bully remains in our field? How does it change our field and how we do our work? Um, yep, yeah, if you don't mind me jumping in. Um, so there's, there's quite rarely a resolution to these things and even more rarely a resolution which um, we would term as fair for the victim um, that has massive impact on an individual level uh, because we live in niche fields it's very easy for perpetrators to enact any form of retaliation for example refusing a reference uh, making a bad reference or simply just whispering in the collaborator's ear at a conference, uh, you know, she's mentally ill, you need to watch her, th you, know, you know, things like this. Um, not having a resolution in university processes is, is very damaging because as an individual, you can't explain why your research output, for example, was less optimal during the 18 months you were being harassed or the 18 months that you were reporting it because these processes can take that long um it can really affect your career uh as a wider issue i think it just it just creates such a toxic culture for everyone because if, if you see someone behaving badly and then you see someone bravely speaking out and you see that they get no justice from it and actually quite the opposite they're punished for speaking out how can you possibly have faith not only in the institution you work for but in the people that didn't come forward in, you know, should I have done more? You question yourself. And it, it just enables the behavior again, because people think you can get away with it. People think that you can, it's, it's okay. And, and they start saying, oh, well, you know, it was a cultural difference or they were just pushing them a little bit too hard and they come up with a reason that they did it, but it's just toxic. Um, so yeah, I think that's me done. If anybody.
Kristian. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, Sabine, can you continue? I think I have a problem with my sound. Oh, yeah, okay, of course. Um, so you, we already spoke about like, um, there's like a bit strong power inequalities in academia and um, things are not necessarily balanced out. And so in our field, we have a lot of these um, research superstars and there seem to be, well, there's some extra level of protection around them because of the reason how the funding systems in universities work. But there's also uh, um, some bibliometric um, uh, reasons behind it, uh, how they come to this position. And I would like to change gears a little bit in our discussions and move towards this. And so my next question is to Rachel. Um, she's working um, on investigating these kind of imbalances in academia. Rachel? Sorry, can you tell us a bit more what's what's currently going on there and what you have found out? Sure, and if okay, I'll share my screen. Because mm -hmm. um, so I've just got a few slides to share with you. Uh, let me go into presentation mode. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Great, okay. So I've got a few slides, but please do shout at me if I'm taking too long. It's, it's not ever, I've got sort of six charts to, slide, to show you, but uh, yeah, give me a nod if you want me to wrap up. So very, very briefly, what we produced this year is a follow-on to a report that we also produced in 2017, which basically looks at the researcher community and tries to capture the gender balance of that. And we look at it um, from the the aspect of the researcher journey. So it's not just about representation, it's also about uh, the research footprint, careers, mobility, and so on and so forth. But I'm not gonna go into the methodology in much detail, but I just want to, the one thing I want to make clear is that what we are working with is gender inference. It is a limitation of the report, but we think the report is so important in what it delivers as a benchmarking tool that we are confident that we, we, it is still absolutely worthwhile. So what we took was 15 countries, we took the names of the authors that have published that are affiliated to those countries over uh, two five-year periods. And we use this third party called NAMSOR, which allows us to give a probability of gender based on the name and the affiliated country. Because of course, the names you know, vary in their uh, perhaps typical, you might say, gender uh, by region and by country. So that's what we're working with. We're not working with self-reported data. Um, and we can talk a lot more about that, but I'll spin on for now. So first of all, what we've been looking at is two time periods, 1999 to 2003, and then 2014 to 2018, as I said, across 15 countries. I should add that those 15 countries, because of the way we're doing this gender inference, do not include perhaps as much of Asia as we might like. It's something that we, we'd all, we're all trying to work on, um, but that name, uh, infer gender inference on names works better among, yeah, non-Asian areas. So anyway, the proportion of women uh, among researchers is increasing, as you can see by the increase in that, that line. So we've got the, the two time periods and we've gone from a ratio of about 40 women per 100 men up to 60. So that, that's positive in terms of the trend over time. And here we look at the countries um, plus EU28, actually, as it was at the time uh, that we've got here. And we can see that quite a few of the countries kind of sit um, pretty close to that, that overall statistic that I just gave you. So the UK there is, is pretty spot on, actually. It's gone you know, from just under 40 to about 60 uh, women per 100 men. There are some outliers. Japan, unfortunately, and we have seen this before in previous research, has a very low ratio of women per men, whereas in Argentina, it's, it's quite the reverse. I won't go into it in great deal of detail right now, but actually that story is a little bit more complex than might at first glance be understood. There are some uh, kind of cultural understandings and cultural um, sort of specificities about what it means to be a researcher in some parts of the world that play into this. So yeah, it's all in the report and I'll let you read that in your own time. One of the things we have been looking at is 
um, researcher age. And as a proxy for age, we looked at the year of first publication of each of these authors that then went on to be active in the period 2014 to 2018. So here we see, if you can track these different colours, this kind of uh, gradual fading, we've got the the oldest group uh, so to speak are in the darker purple that's a and then uh, leading up to d where the first publication was in that time period that we're looking at 2014 to 2018 and what we can see is that the ratio as you can see here tracks pretty steadily upwards so the ratio of women per men is actually much higher in the younger cohorts than in the older cohorts now there could be uh, a range of re reasons for that there could be issues around career progression, um, there could be just perhaps cultural differences in the generations, so to speak, um, yeah, the, that are driving that. And here we see again that we've got um, across at least some of the countries and regions we looked at, most countries again looking pretty similar to that overall uh, statistic that I just showed you, but Again, we've got a couple of outliers, Argentina and Japan there, which is showing a slightly different story. Then just two more aspects I want to show you. First of all, we did find that women on average published less than men. So in this chart, if this black line here was in the middle, we would have parity in that this, that's the ratio of the average number of publications by women to men. Unfortunately, it's not in the middle. We do see that, the, that women do publish less, But what we did find is that women researchers have very similar citation impact to men. Across all authors, i.e. no matter where a man or a woman sits in the author order on a research paper, we found pretty much exact parity. This is the ratio of field weighted citation impact, which is a measure, again, I'll do this very briefly, it's a measure of citation impact to a set of research publications that takes into account the different uh, citation activities among different subject areas, among different publication years, and among different document types. So it takes all of it, basically evens everything out and gives us a nice, clean kind of playing field to look at. However, what we did find is that when um, women are the first authors, uh, then the parity drops slightly, it's, a, well, it's no longer quite parity. And, um, yet yeah, women's researchers have a slightly lower citation impact and then when they are the first author. So there could be more to unpick there. So I'll stop sharing that. I'm going to, I'm going to share a link to the report because there's just, I mean, that's just sort of tip of the iceberg and, and each of those analyses goes into a lot more detail as well. But yeah, that's what we found. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? And Firstly, that's, I think that's really, really encouraging. So that's fantastic. Um, I was thinking the other day about um, when also preparing for this panel and trying to look at some data for disabled researchers uh, in the UK and, and elsewhere, that it is really, really difficult to, to find um, data with the same definitions of what counts and so on, but also to compare it specifically for the field. And so I was wondering if, um, do, do you think a lot of these research would be helped by, for example, journals asking authors when they publish to actually provide the, this personal information, you know, your gender, your um, disability or, or ethnicity, to try and get a breakdown of this. Absolutely, and it's the direction we're traveling in. So what we recognize is that we at Elsevier have a lot of data with Scopus, our abstract and citation index. Um, we have, you know, so much publication data, we have so much author data but we don't have that personal information and we need to be extremely careful there, of course. We need to be very careful that we are trustworthy and that we have the, all the right systems and so forth in place to capture that. But the only way we're gonna get benchmarks on these other aspects of inclusion and diversity is to ask authors, editors, peer reviewers to self-report some of these aspects about themselves. We would then have to be careful that, of course, we, we report at aggregate level, at an aggregate level that's reasonable so that anonymity is, is maintained throughout. But it is the direction of travel that we're going in. And actually, we, um, 
So with a number of people from around the world outside of Elsevier, we've got an inclusion and diversity board that we set up, I think it was in March this year, that's headed up by our CEO and also the editor in chief of the Lancet, Richard Horton. And already since March, that's what they've really been tasking us within the company to, to tackle and to focus on. So we need to put, we need to get our ducks in a row. We need to make sure that everything, as I said, is, is sorted <laughs> so that we, you can trust us with that data. But yes, that is the, the next step. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I love that you've got a really angry shark just by your shoulder as well. I, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't get distracted. It's like, yeah, get your metrics right. That's what the little yeah. shark seems to be telling me. Um, can I just Absolutely. ask a question? Like, do you do you think is there is there any data so far about the impact of the coronavirus? I know it's so recent, but I'm just wondering. There's there's a big hunch that all of us have is that the women aren't going to be publishing as much. And I just I just wanted to know whether there's anything being done about to follow that. Absolutely. So yes, I mean you're right, and I imagine a lot of people, um, you know, working in research will have spotted various different um, sort of media stories, Twitter chats pieces from uh, you know, editorials from from journal editors and so forth that are starting to report this we are still in the middle of measuring this and we're trying to you know we need to be careful that we've got the right comparison we haven't been capturing uh, gender self-reported gender data for ever so long so you know while we'd love to do a comparison from this pandemic period to something last year we can't quite do that so we're looking at measuring it a little bit earlier uh, perhaps at the end of last year Certainly, there are the early signs from quite a few editors, from journal editors, are that submissions, submissions as a whole are up, but the shares of submissions from women are down. What we haven't got a handle on yet, just because we're still collecting that data, is to what extent that is the case. And then I think, you know, this isn't just, an, um, this isn't just for us at, at Elsevier, I think many, many publishers are looking at this, and like them, we are all trying to put uh, the right support in place as much as we can to try and help that situation. I mean, you know, many publishers are doing that already in, in all sorts of ways at the moment. So things from setting up to help editors, for example, we're setting up coronavirus review boards specifically um, to adding author resources to our websites to help support working from home and uh, perhaps internet connection issues and things like that. The, the whole community is doing that, but there will have to be some gender specific uh, resources put in place as well. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's slightly too early for me to report on the findings of that at the that moment. That was really useful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, Rachel, um, knowing about all the, the hurdles minorities have to jump over, so things like Sophia has touched on, like that timelines for disabled people are sometimes different than for others and also knowing about implicit bias amongst um, referees um, or even the the editor you really hope to um, persuade to send out your your paper for review um, do you think papers or publications are a good measure or are the right measure for academic success they are a measure, but they certainly shouldn't be the only one. Um, I think, so something that we, so in my bio, uh, I, it was mentioned that I'm part of the, a, um, a part of Elsevier called the International Centre for the Study of Research. That's focused on the study of research and research evaluation and assessment. And what we're particularly focused on at the moment is trying to come up with a more holistic way of reporting on what a researcher does. You know, we have all the systems in the world that will report on publication counts, your citation counts, your H index, which journals you've published in and so forth. But that's only, it's quite a narrow view. It's an important view and it probably won't go away at all, but it's a, it's a narrow view. And we want to build that out. We want to think about those things that actually might need self-reporting. It might be activities um, like teaching, like uh, what... Um, what panels are you on? Have you, have you been to? What uh, additional boards are you on? And so on and so forth. And yeah, we're working towards that. We're working towards identifying with researchers and with research institutions what those aspects of, the, of what a researcher does might be. And then internally, we'll be figuring out 
how our systems can elevate that information, as I say, show that more holistic view of a researcher. Thank you. I'm aware that I'm talking a lot about the future and what we will be doing and how great we will be. <laughs> but yes, this is, this is all to come, it's, but it is a, a very high priority for us. So uh, thank you for everybody. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna change topic to discussing solutions to existing problems. There mm -hmm. seems to be a large interest among the questions of the audience on um, the difficulties of many researchers experience uh, in world terms of working conditions. Some people have asked, uh, why is it so difficult for, for the postdocs with 10 years of experience to still find a job? And some people have asked about the mental health toll of uh, changing from contracts to contracts. And there are numerous questions in the audience about working conditions and the productive models. So I'm gonna ask you, what could we change in the productive model and the way we work and hire in academia to make research more inclusive to, to everyone? Um, you can, can be related to any other things we have discussed during the, the panel, could be harassment or intersectionality or uh, chronic conditions or even metrics. Or... I, I think for, um, so a, a quick point for, for research and uh, for, for disabled people in research in general would just be additional flexibility in the sense that um, uh, what, what many people report from, for example, uh, conference organizers is that if you ask for additional provisions it's very hard to be flexible and and I imagine also with the for example research councils when, when you have your fellowship applications or funding applications the lack of flexibility exists because you want an efficient framework um, that works optimally for for the majority of people but uh, we, without this additional flexibility it's going to be really hard to accommodate uh, those who cannot fit into that box. Mm -hmm. So, for example, flexibility in deadlines for submissions. Yes, exactly. And um, uh, I think also some flexibility in, for example, funding arrangements. It is, it is difficult because uh, I think the current model very much emphasizes a high density of publications per time unit. Um, which also from a very pragmatic po point of view makes sense in the sense that you want your, your funding to produce the highest number, you know, the, 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 according to some measure, the more, more, the more research, uh, the better. Um, but that leads to a very short term perspective on the kind of research you produce, uh, which I think is also a more wide ranging problem, but there's, there's less open skies research and there's more, you know, people go for the low hanging fruit. Um, because that's what the funding model rewards. And in a similar manner, I think those who, who can provide really unique perspectives uh, and insights uh, because they come from diverse backgrounds and such um, are not encouraged to take this extra time, but simply because the, the, the current climate doesn't allow for that. So sadly, I think the, the solution is a change in the funding model, which then also requires society to make more, uh, and also po politicians in that sense, to make more funding available in these cases. Also for longer period. Does anybody want to add? Yes, please. Yes, we would like to add that I think Sophia is right in the sense that people reward or the funding agencies at the moment reward too much quantity and too little quality. And to achieve quality, you need to focus for a long period of time on something. And you have to pretty much produce a lot of papers to get some funding and then produce more papers and it gets a vicious circle. It is uh, something that has a very negative influence on all of us, but especially on people who are on postdoc contracts, which are fixed term, because they have an existential burden in the sense that they have to guarantee the next job. And this is something that is not working properly because what you do is you stop seeing the grants as a means to an end and you start to see the grant as an end in itself for instance i i know many people who say i'm publishing this paper because i want this grant and it should be the opposite you should get that funding to do that work but the way the whole system is set up and also, if you look at the pressure the universities put on academics to uh, get more and, more and more and more money, 
it ends up being something short term. In some cases, there is even a culture of deceit because many of us end up promising things that are not fulfilled in that time frame. And if you look at the whole picture within society, this leads to uh, the overall public calling our performance into question, like what these people are doing. It is, we need to have some changes. You need at least to have some ground funding so that you can keep on going and you are not so dependent on short-term grants. Uh, in the, you have mentioned several uh, issues. Uh, one is uh, the model, one is the way we measure production in the model, metrics, and the other one is the culture itself. So it's a very multi complex, multivariate problem. Um, what would you? What can we do to change this huge conglomerate? For example, what is the value of having spaces like this one to discuss issues that affect uh, social issues that affect scientists? I think it's valid, but it cannot be the only way because you need to get involved in trying to inform policy, but what you're providing is a forum where people can address something more than science and hopefully can change or can contribute to culture change. But this is not going to be the only uh, factor contributing to that. You have to raise awareness, you have to have forums, but you have to find ways of influencing policy because policy only changes if you have pressure from below. It's not the scientists should also be political. Yes, because uh, policies and this one, I mean, they look at history. When was there a societal change? Was only when there was a huge pressure from below and then they had to change it. So it cannot be, uh, it cannot be just a single type of approach. It has to be multi-pronged. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it has to be sustained as well. Um, what we've seen post Me Too movement is, is a huge movement from universities to change their harassment policies. But a bit of a slowdown now that nobody's looking anymore. Um, and so, you, you, and again, with the, preca the precarious nature of, of contracts, unfortunately, some of the figureheads of the grassroots movement have to move on because they can't find a job. Um, yeah, so it, ha it has to be a, a sustained thing. And I, I think I think it was Carla who said it, but I think honesty is, is one of the most important things in all of this, in, in educating the next generations for, for, for getting jobs. I hate it when PhD students are used as, as a resource. They're, ref they're referred to as a resource in meetings and actually they're human beings who have a right to be trained properly for a range of careers and spoken to honestly about the chances of them actually getting an academic job, which are small. Um, and we should recognise that and see a PhD as a training programme for a much, much wider um, form of careers. It's not, it's not a training position to be an academic. That wouldn't make sense because the most people don't do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's about honesty. And can I, can I just ask a question? Because I'm, I'm an astrophysicist, so I've not been at the whole of this conference at all. But what, what number of participants tune in to the other sessions? Do you know? To the scientific talks. Yeah. I think there were about 200 to 250 people. See, that's really good then, because you've got about 130 participants on this call. And I was trying to figure out what kind of proportion <laughs> are actually attending the EDI session, because that's very impressive, because normally, you know, the conferences I've been to, the EDI sessions are a bit more like tumbleweed. And it's the same people that come every time and every time and, and that's not an effective way of instigating change. What you need to is you need to talk to a much, your much wider audience, which is exactly what you've done here. Um, you've managed to get people listening, <laughs> which, is, which is really good. I yeah. presented uh, last year to a conference uh, at a, a lunchtime session. Uh, the previous session ended, 400 people traipsed out, six people stayed um, to a oh. session that where I was presenting. That was tough. That's and it was a painful. huge room and I couldn't even get them to move forward to be a little bit closer. So yeah, but I wanted yeah. to 
I wanted to just add that I, I completely agree about the multi-pronged approach. I think there's also space for all of us to be self-reflective here as well. You know, very few of us are perfect. Um, all of us have a role to play and to consider what, what we could change and what we could, we could do ourselves. I think that policy change is so, so important, but, but so are all of us individually. And for me, um, thinking about the, say the participation in, in research and science, from um, perhaps a gender perspective, the only way I see that being fixed is if we think about how we treat three-year-olds, how we treat 11-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 30-year-olds, you know, and all the way through this, this only works for me at quite a high kind of societal level and uh, across the entire population, which is a huge challenge, but uh, for me, that's what's gonna fix it one day. I agree. There are a couple of questions from our audience, which I would like to uh, could, could I just could sorry could I could I just follow on for that really really quickly um so I, I think that's a really really good point that everyone has to take personal responsibility in their uh, uh in their interaction with everyone around them in the academic environment but I also wanted to um say that I think a particular responsibility lies with the with the PIs and the so-called you know the superstars and if there are any of you listening to this talk I think please take it to heart that you have the influence to try and change a lot of things in this field. So for example, um, the, there was a study that found that some disabled people found it was actually easier to work, to get um, PhDs with people who were these um, uh, big shots, well-established figures, I, I should say, um, because they were less worried about super high outputs and they actually allowed the student to, to take their own time and go about their own thing. So uh, if you have the influence and, and power, if you, if you are in that position, I think that you have a huge responsibility to try and use that in a very positive way. Thanks, that's it. Thank you. Um, so I would like to pose a question from Josh Silverstone and he asked if we can learn something from industry and he wants to know if how harassment is handled differently in industry versus academia. Are they doing something better? Um, we try to work with as many partners as possible industry um what industrial partners do we have we we don't tend to see a big difference they're not they're not doing well <laughs> compared to to academia necessarily i think because as we've touched on it's a cultural problem uh, it's a power problem and you get that in academia and industry and everywhere where you have these the you know the people in power exploiting those not in power um the army's an interesting one um, so within the army we find that actually they have huge books of, of codes of conduct when it comes to sexual misconduct because they they are in high pressure situations and they have to be sure that people are behaving properly and so uh, we've spoken to people from the navy where there's there's a very different culture where if an officer was to have sexual relationship with um, uh, one of their subordinate is that the word, right word? Um, people then it would be they would be just a pariah in terms of, of the culture like it was really really looked down and we don't have that in academia so there's a very big cultural difference I think but in terms of um, learning with how they deal with them academia seems to be one of the worst places for um, firing people um, the protection that is given to academics within uh, tenure in the US but just permanent positions in the UK the protections are almost impossible to break and so to, 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 to fire someone in the UK is, is nigh on impossible um, unless there's been a criminal conviction and I mean there's even been a case where there was a criminal conviction of abuse and the university still didn't do anything until the Guardian exposed it um unfortunately and i'm i'm, I'm really gonna have to go in a minute i'm so sorry <laughs> um, um so we're at the end of our time um we hope we can move all the remaining audience question over to slack and start a discussion there that would be amazing mm -hmm. um could i ask maybe do you, i would like to to finish on a positive note and could i ask all our panel members do you have any take home advice or a piece of message you want to share with our audience after we had this discussion? Yeah, those people at the other side of the camera.
Well, I could, if, be if you want a positive <laughs> message at the end, <laughs> we've been measuring uh, the, the gender balance of re the research community for many years now, going back to I think to tw at least 2015. Every time we look at it, it gets a little bit better. That representation of women among researchers, the f research footprint, the, the, you know, the, the relative publication output and so forth, it gets a little bit better every time. And that's because of all the uh, effort that so many people around the research community are putting in. It's about the practices that are being shared amongst publishers, editors, researchers, and so on. It's not perfect, we've got a long way to go, but it is getting better. Thank you. We also accept tiny pieces of advice, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would say that um, in terms of if you've experienced um, harassment or bullying, the difference from a few years ago is that now there's an army out there ready to help you. Um, so that if you do want to come forward and that it has to be your decision, um, there are journalists which spe specialize in exposing this. There are lawyers that specialize in taking legal action against universities on this. There, there's our own website. There are other websites with advice for complainants, which just didn't exist a few years ago. But also, if you have experienced it, there's, there's almost, <laughs> how do I phrase this? You don't have to come forward. Um, something that has been released in the last few years is that real need for people to come forward with their awful, awful soul-wrenching stories of what's happened to them. We've got a lot of them in the media now. Um, there isn't that pressure to come forward anymore. And I think, I think certainly for me a few years ago, um, not having that pressure would have helped me deal with it a little bit more on a personal level. You know, you, know, you, you don't have to come forward if you don't want to anymore but if you do <laughs> there's an army ready <laughs> i think i can, I, I, I can... Like to... sorry yeah, thank you uh, I, I like to call it a big family i mean i think we just have to look at history sorry i interrupted you i think we just have to look at history there there's a lot to be done but things have been much worse so, I mean, we all have responsibility. It's not because we are scientists that we are not political beings. And every one of us has responsibilities to ensure things keep on getting better. It's not time to be complacent. You can see that you cannot take anything for granted. If you look at Brexit, if you look at Trump, if you look at all these things, but still things have improved. And they will just continue to improve if we make an effort and a joint effort. This cannot be the burden of minorities. This cannot be the burden of uh, underrepresented groups. I think also on a very, so also ending on a very positive um, note, the, the number of, um, or the, the, the technological revolution in the last 10, 20 years with the internet, with computers becoming really powerful, has meant that disabled people have a participation in society and in education and in research that they've never had before. And especially for visually impaired um, people, especially anything text-based um, is accessible and, and they can access it. And it's, it's been great. And even, even from 10 years ago, when I went to uni at undergrad, it's become so much better. Um, and I'm really encouraged by that. And I think if anyone um, is, has a disability and it's your dream to be a researcher or to do a PhD or to continue in the field, you know, don't give up. It's, it, it is hard sometimes, but um, with creativity and supporting people around you, um, it is brilliant and, and you can enjoy it a lot and do, do it, just go for it. Just don't take no for an answer. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very glad to hear there are some, that you observe some positive changes. So I think we reached the end of the, our time together today, but I would like to point out to everyone that we are moving over the questions which you have posted on Slido to Slack. And also our tech team has just informed me there is a way of continue to ask anonymous questions. So this is either by directly uh, emailing Will Dixon, a member of our tech team, or any other member of the tech team, and ask him if they can post a question in an anonymous way on the Slack channel. Alternatively, you can just uh, stay on this Slido 
jet here, which will remain active throughout the day and our tech team will continue copy and pasting the questions that come in into the Slack channel. Thank you very much to all our panel members here. That discussion has been absolutely wonderful and I think very insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Uh, Bye. I'd like to thank the attendees and the IT team and the members of the uh, team who helped organize in this session too, Naomi, Chloe, and Jake. Uh, with that, I would like to have, let's go have some coffee for all of us. <laughs> That's good. Um, I'd also, a very last thing, um, if anyone has any questions about visually impaired people and science and making um, learning material accessible, you can always email me. I think my, I will put my email in the EDI, uh, in, in the EDI section in Slack, and I'm re very happy to answer any questions. Sophia, I can tell you there were a couple of questions directly for you. Okay, fantastic. I'll, I'll try and address them in the Slack. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.